Hello and welcome to The Cutting Room, the movie show from all the right movies. I'm John, and with me today are Westy. Hello. And Matt. Hello. Today, it's Spielberg again. We're in Normandy 1944 to talk the World War II classic, Saving Private Ryan. Yes. Depicting the grim and desperate horrors of war, the idea to do this one came from the grim and desperate horrors of Westy's mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you put it up, Westy? I put this up because we discussed it in the, the Rankin Spielberg episode, and I just don't feel like we discussed it enough. I, I don't know if you guys are going to understand this, but I've tried to articulate it the best I can about this last week, and I've written it down, and I've read it back. <laughs> And I'd hope it makes sense. But this is when films stopped being films. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> Give us a chance. <laughs> I'd seen this before I'd seen Schindler's List, for example. Right. So that level of reality didn't feel like a film. It felt yeah. like something completely different from the sound design to the act, to everything that was just so visceral. It's the visceral sense of this film that really mm. rang home and I was physically shaken by it and it was a really important time for me because I realised just how powerful films can be and just how powerful an experience that it can be and it's just one of them films that really hits home with me I'll not get tired of watching it I'll always defend it I think it's an absolute masterpiece of a film it's unbelievable well unlike you Westy I don't have the strongest memories of this coming out back in 1998 really? No, 98, I think I was probably too busy watching the Phantom Menace trailer on repeat. <laughs> Funny other films. <laughs> but yeah. the vague recollections I do of this are around the realism. How realistic a portrayal of the horrors of warfare it was supposed to be, yeah. and mainly seen in the depiction of the Omaha beach landing at the start. Yes, We'll talk all about the beach landing, but Saving Private Ryan's about a lot more than that to me, and we're going to discuss all of it. I mean, yes. Spielberg... Hanks, Matt Damon, all at their best for me. One of the most acclaimed World War II movies that's still highly thought of now, mm-hmm. based on a historic event, obviously. So, lots to unpack with this one, I think. Yeah. yeah. I've certainly never seen Vin Diesel better than this. We all got a weak spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah, not much of a push. <laughs> and Matt, the fine Bye, instrument of warfare. warfare that you are, why do you want to talk about SPR? <laughs> yes, I am that indeed. Uh, quite similar to both of you, really. I think this was one of the most hyped films I think I'd ever seen at the cinema at that point mm-hmm. because all I'd heard from months on end was how shocking this opening battle sequence mm-hmm. was going to be. Yeah. And I was this, you know, kind of slightly cocky 18 year old who thought he knew everything about war films because I'd seen Full Metal Jacket. You know, oh, this isn't going <laughs> to shock me. I've seen that one. I love to be able to see what I look like coming out of that screening because I imagine I was as white as a sheet. And I'd learned two things during that first watch of this film. One, I didn't know half as much about cinema as I thought I did. And I didn't know half as much about life as I thought I did, quite honestly. This is a film Mm -hmm. that genuinely changed me in quite a significant manner. And there's not that many films I can say that about. It's one I've got a real personal attachment to. I'm so glad we've got around to it. Yeah. Yeah, great. We'll see you on the beach then. Mm. South Shields Beach, obviously. Omaha, no chance. <laughs> yeah, no chance. <laughs> Worst thing you've got there is seagulls. That'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> We're talking Saving Private Ryan. When a Normandy invasion company are sent on one last mission to find a private whose three brothers have been killed in combat, Captain John Miller takes his men behind enemy lines. Embarking on personal journeys of honour and courage, the company finds strength in one another while facing the brutal realities of war. In one this is going to be a cheery one. <laughs> Starting to see why you chose it, Westy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Directed by Steven Spielberg and written by Robert Rodas, Saving Private Ryan was produced by DreamWorks and Paramount and there's a big main cast but stars in the two leads, Tom Hanks as Captain Miller and Matt Damon as Private James Ryan. So on The Cutting Room, what we do is talk about films by looking at their key creative elements. With Saving Private Ryan, it's the director, the writing, the cast, and our own highlights. And then we did give the film a rating out of 10, won't we? Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. To start at the start then, it's the director. 
it's Steven Spielberg. By 1998, Steven Spielberg was already a veteran of 18 movies, the most commercially successful director of all time, he still is, and a Best Director Oscar winner. And he went on to win his second for Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. Deserved, Matt? How good is Spielberg's direction on Saving Private Ryan? Oh, I mean, to make a film like this that both reinvents and then defines the genre at the same time is a pretty special accomplishment, I think. And there must have been so many directors at the time who probably had ideas for war film that watched this went, back to the drawing board, lads. Just, you know, Spielberg's done it again, you know, because this changed yeah. how war films look forever. It changed how we talk about World War II and film. I mean, I was brought up on the likes of The Dirty Dozen and The Great Escape and it's really difficult to imagine films like those, as brilliant as they are, being made today because they made war look like an adventure. <laughs> and Spielberg, arguably yeah. the first mainstream director, went, it wasn't, you know, this is what it was like. Yeah. And everything that came after, not necessarily World War Two, of course, but, you know, Hacksaw Ridge, We Were Soldiers, Black Hawk Down, all owe a massive, massive debt to what Spielberg does mm-hmm. here. Definitely. Because what he brings is a depth of realism we'd never seen before. And there's plenty of examples to talk about. Mm-hmm. The carrier lands on the beach, the door slams down, and before the soldiers take one step out of it, that German machine gun just bam, 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 mm-hmm. cuts them to pieces. Yeah. In war films mm-hmm. before this, someone it's gets shot. It's you in the carrier as well, though. Yeah. That's the genius of Spielberg. Yeah. He puts you at the back, yeah. and you see everyone falling in front of you, and you think, yeah. I'm done for here. And it's yeah. just complete panic. It's yeah. genius. It is. It's amazing because before this, someone gets shot in a war film, a squib goes off, they'll cut the chest and fall over, but not here. So if a director's job is to show you things you've never seen before, or try to, I can't speak highly enough of what Spielberg does here and how he changed this genre forever. But of all people, do you know who turned it down though before Spielberg got it? No. It was Michael Bay. It was Michael Bay because he said he did not know Michael what to do with it. <laughs> I mean, of thank he God. didn't. He didn't <laughs> know what to do with Pearl Harbor. He still made that pile of exactly, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never knows what to do. <laughs> yeah, Spielberg. I mean, so many classics across so many genres, but his ability to tell an engaging, entertaining story in a visual way is pretty much unmatched for me. And I think Stephen Private Ryan is one of the best examples of it. The visuals are breathtaking, which we'll talk about. The filmmaking techniques and innovations on display here are astonishing. We'll talk about that as well. But what I want to talk about now is the tone of the movie. I know that Spielberg saw the film as a passion project and an ought to his father, Arnold Spielberg, who had actually fought in the war. Spielberg never thought it would be a hit, though, and his first idea was about making a boy's own type adventure. That's mm. Boys Own Magazine, not Boys Own with <laughs> Ronan Keating yeah. and the lads. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Just standing up off the stools as the landing craft hit. <laughs> <laughs> Key change. <laughs> but when he started interviewing veterans, Spielberg ditched Keating and the boys in favour of presenting realism on screen. And yeah. I can't personally comment on how realistic the battle scenes are in Saving Private Ryan, thankfully, but I can talk about how they feel to watch and the feel horrible. I mean, we've seen the horrors of war depicted on screen before, the ride of the Valkyries in Apocalypse Now springs to mind, but nothing feels like this to me. The toughest to watch battle scenes I've ever seen. It looks like hell on earth, which is the idea, and I can only imagine is surely realistic. I mean, there are many, many World War II movies, classic ones as well, but honestly, I think objectively, Saving Private Ryan might be the best of the lot, and up there among Spielberg's best too. That's how good it is. Yeah, I have to agree. So what do you think, Westy? I think as a director, he's kind of, he's earned his place now. He knows what he's doing and he has such a grasp of cinema now that he can really hit home what these guys went through and what his dad went through. And I think that's a real person. This is a real personal film for him. It's, hard, it's the first time Spielberg's never used music to reinforce the visuals. He's used sound design and the sound design in this is beyond compare. But even better than the sound design is what Janusz Kaminski brought to this. He did Schindler's List in black and white. Right, now we're doing a World War II, like, action drama. And Kaminski, 
absolutely brings his A-game. Like It's one of the first times that you see that 45-degree shutter, which is really fast shutter speed, so you see everyone moving. I mean, Scott used that in the opening of Gladiator. Do You know, you see all of the movements, you yeah. see every frame. And actually fixed on, like vibrating boxes onto the camera itself so that when the guns are shooting it feels like the camera is the gun yeah. and it's going off yeah. at the same time which matches the sound design which is why i've mentioned that so the visuals and the audio and the the acting and the camera movements all just tap into each other who else could do that i mean yeah. terence malik had a really good bash with the thin red line which came out yeah. the same year but the the, the 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 poetry in that you know, the deep meaning in that, the, it, it doesn't have the visceral element that this does, and I think they both reinvented it. It's just an incredible piece of work from start to finish. There's such, like, a, a, a dedication to the filmmaking in this. It's a dedication, and you are dedicated to watching it, and I, I love it for that. It's fantastic. Yeah, and Saving Private Ryan, Kaminsky had an idea where you mentioned there, Wesley, typically a camera shoot has apparently set at the 180-degree angle, and Kaminsky said it's yeah. 1945 degrees, which shortens the amount of time the film's exposed to light, which makes the image look much sharper. Yes. And then when it was processed, he had the film run through the developer more than usual as well to achieve a washed out look. And then that saturates the colour by about 50 yeah. or 60%. Yeah. That all works brilliantly. It gives the yeah. visuals a real 1940s authenticity, I think, but it still looks quite modern as well. Yeah. When that came on television, people were turning the saturation up on the telly and had to have like a disclaimer saying, this is how it's supposed to look. Yeah. It's fine. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people like turn it up, yeah. <laughs> well, as I mentioned there, Spielberg won his second Best Director Oscar for Saving Private Ryan, but the film uh -huh. did miss out on Best Picture. You know what won? Yes. Oh, yeah. Shakespeare in Love. It was. Shakespeare in Love won seven Oscars. Mm. Stephen Warbeck for Shakespeare in Love. For Shakespeare in Love. Shakespeare in Love. The game, Judy Dent. And the Oscar goes to... Shakespeare in Love. Furious. Well, to finish on Steven Spielberg, we have a question from one of our patrons. So, a benefit of being in all the right movies patron is that we'll answer your questions on the show, and we have one right now from our very own Private Ryan. That's Ryan Shippo. So... <laughs> Yes, Ryan. He's going to love that. <laughs> hey, guys. Hope you're doing well. I've got a quick Steven Spielberg question for you. It seems like that guy's been making great movies for almost 50 years. In your opinion, what genre does he do the best? Thanks. Thanks for that, Ryan. Good question there, Matt. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Spielberg's mm -hmm. best genre? If I say the fantasy genre thing that for me that would cover his like sci-fi and action films under that umbrella right, for me right okay yeah and because he's made some great like grown-up dramas this shinless list i'm a really big fan of munich i love that film but yeah, sometimes yeah. when he makes those types of films he does get on the soapbox a little bit too much you know mm. like amistad looks great but it's two and a half hours of lecture about slavery and yeah. I know that slavery is bad. I don't really need that. So I'd say his fantasy films are, is, is where he's at his best. Good shout. And Wesley, Spielberg's best genre for you? Spielberg's best genre is one that no one talks about and one that he's incredibly good at and one that he hasn't explored enough, and that's the horror genre. <laughs> what? Jaws, <laughs> Jaws is an incredible horror film. Yeah. That's a horror film. Saving yeah. Private Ryan is a horror film. More or less. Look what he can do and how he can make you feel. How scared he can make you feel. I was sitting there mm. physically shaken by mm. what he can do and what he can accomplish with sound and visuals. It was his absolute idol. Hitchcock? Mm. No, I think it's like it's like Matt said. It's for me. I mean, Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of my favourite films of all time. But I think it's when he really explores human emotions, no matter what film it is. You always feel something with a Spielberg film. Mm. So any genre, really, I think he's going to be applauded at doing. I mean, West Side Story, I thought, was fantastic. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's, it's musical. Great. It just looks beautiful. But for me, my favourite genre that Spielberg does is horror. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, though, one of the great war movies, and Spielberg deserving of that Oscar? Oh, oh absolutely. 100%. Yeah, should have got five for it. Saving Private Ryan was written by Robert Rodit. He was Oscar nominated for the film, and when you look at the other bodies of work over the years, it does stand out as the jewel in his screenwriting crown. Yeah. How good is the writing here, Matt, on Saving Private Ryan? I think it might be the most underrated part of the film, I think, mm -hmm. because one criticism 
I see this film get all the time is people say, oh, it's a great battle at the beginning, great battle at the end, nothing in between though, which yeah, I couldn't disagree yeah. with more. Yeah. The middle is the heart of the film yeah. and the heart of the film is that unit because you feel it every time one of them gets killed and that's in the writing. And the characteriz- characterization might be broad strokes, okay, but it all pays off. So you've got Mellish, the Jewish character, wisecracking, but that pays off in that amazing scene where all the German POWs are walk past him. And he takes yeah, out Juden. a star of David and starts going, Juden, yeah. Juden. Yeah. Juden. Like, you know, fuck you, I'm Jewish. Look who's yeah. captured you. Brilliant. Or Ivan, the most cynical of the unit, the one who hates the mission from the get-go. He's got it in from Ryan before he's even met him. But then you get that brilliant moment in Ramel where they've built the defensive positions and they know the Germans are going to be on them at any minute. And he just has this little sideways look at Ryan. And, and you can see he gets this look in his eye like, oh, he's just a kid. He didn't ask for this. And he's sat here next to me, being as brave as I am. Brilliant payoff for that character. And then the last one I'd mention is Upham, because I think he has the most tragic arc, mm. completely yeah. out of his depth. Doesn't know what he's doing. Tries to keep the moral high ground when they've captured that German who the others want to execute. This is not right. He's a real innocent, but by the end, when he sees Miller killed, then he shoots that German. Just look at the last time you see Upham. Just that thousand yard stare in a complete daze, and you just know he's never going to be the same man again. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, you could say maybe some of the dialogue's a bit on the nose, maybe gets a bit sentimental, but the writing is far better than it's usually given credit for. And for me, a highlight is that unit. I think it's packed full of memorable characters. It is. Yeah, I mean, the realism in the set pieces are the things that get talked about most often on Saving Private Ryan, probably rightly, but I think the things that make it really work as a film are the story and the characters. We don't get loads of backstory for the characters, but when we do, it's usually striking and memorable, and it's always Mm -hmm. very human. I like the scene in the abandoned church where Wade tells a story about his mother and how he would pretend to be asleep when she came home from work. Really simple, but I find that really powerful. And the moment Mrs. Ryan is visited by the military to tell her about her sons and she collapses on the porch. Huge, that. Mm. And the narrative is excellent. Searching through a war zone for one man to get him home because his brothers have been killed. I think that's a very good concept. And bookending that with two superb 25-minute battle sequences I think is a great idea, structure-wise. Also, something I think is interesting is I think this is an instance where studio interference made the script better. Robert Rodett's screenplay went through 11 drafts of revisions requested by the studio, and it was the studio that came up with a lot of the humanity that I was talking about, like Miller's backstory of being a school teacher who wants to go home to his wife, Steamboat Willie, the right. German character who betrays them, didn't exist at first, yeah. and the characters of Mellish right. and Capazzo came later as well. So studio right. revisions, right. not always a bad thing, but yeah, no. at the end of it all, a screenplay that I think was rightly nominated at the Oscars, even if it was beaten by Shakespearean love. Everybody at Miramax who worked so hard, especially Harvey Weinstein, a man of dedication and vision. But, yeah, no. at the end of it all... And Rusty, what do you think of the writing? <laughs> I love the writing in this. I'd, like you guys have you know, have, have said so eloquently, and it, it makes absolute, absolute sense. But I've read the ninth draft of this. <laughs> <laughs> Three from the end. <laughs> <laughs> Three from the end, and... Um, it does. It does change quite significantly. Right. I mean, them characters hadn't been introduced in, but well, he wasn't introduced. And um, Miller was a big cigar chewing. <laughs> we're going to get through this, and you know, it, it, I think it was a different feature. I don't think it was Omaha, but they had the cliffs, and they were all trying to climb the cliffs, and the ropes were getting cut, and people were falling down, and Jackson had to come in and shoot them. It was there was elements of it there, but what maintained, and I want, I think, what Robert Rod had brought to it was this overlying theme of family. I think there's so many mm. families in this film, mm. and so many family units in this film. Miller, sorry, when he's, he's talking at Omaha, he even calls Hover, like, I thought you were my mother. I thought you were, like, the yeah. mother of the group, and you've got the father and the mother, and you've got the kids there, and they're all bickering about themselves. Even brings Ted Danson in there. Yeah. Why is Danson in there yeah. from nowhere? <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> oh, I love Danson. I love him. He's brilliant. <laughs> Should be behind that, the bar. That Thompson steaming, just like, <laughs> clean him up. Brilliant. There's so many bits in this film where it has a father-son relationship, I think Miller and Ryan end up being a father-son kind of dynamic. It's not strange to then think that Hanks and Spielberg went on to do a show called Band of Brothers, mm-hmm. you know? It's yeah. just... But if you watch it again, it's, it's a family it's a family film. <laughs> but not a family film. It's not E.T. <laughs> it's a family horror film. <laughs> it's a family horror film, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's up all again. I think it's fairly well known now that Saving Private Ryan is not based on, but inspired by real events. Do you know much about that? 
I know there was mm-hmm. four brothers who were, was it four brothers or three? And they were in the, it was the Navy though, it wasn't the Army, right? And they were on separate battleships. I, I can't remember who yeah, it was. Yeah, so Robert Rodert came up with the story in 1994 when he saw a monument in a cemetery in Tonawanda, New York. The monument was to the Nyland brothers. There were four of them fighting in yes. the Second World War. And when three of them were reported killed, the surviving brother, called Fritz, was sent home. It actually turned out later that another of the brothers was alive and he'd been in the Burmese POW camp. But imagine that happened here. The brothers aren't dead after all. Worst ending ever. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Would it be? There's a scene in the film where General Marshall reads out a letter that Abraham Lincoln sent to a woman called Lydia Bixby. And that's a real letter from the American Civil War in 1964, sent after she lost five sons. And he's reading that out with such power like yeah. half Presnell plays that role and he's amazing in Fargo but if I'm gonna get a voiceover I want that guy to do it <laughs> yeah. it's just so powerful yeah. the way he reads yeah. that out it's yeah. amazing now the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle I don't get why he's memorized the letter does he memorize every letter he ever gets? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking this this might come up because this is this is World War Two. <laughs> yeah. But it's just there as well, like yeah. in his drawer. Why has he even got it? Yeah. yeah. It should be in lo- under lock yeah. and key, surely. <laughs> It's like, like the hateful eight when he's got it in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a letter from Lincoln. Letter from Lincoln. Well, some doubt's actually been cast on that letter now because apparently historians now say only two of the Dear Bixby's sons died and at least two of the others deserted, like ran off. Right. <laughs> All right. So General Marshall wrote it just to have that speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, inspired by real or not real events then, and Robert Rode had carried across that reality of war aspect into the rest of Saving Private Ryan's script to produce a very good screenplay, we think. Oh, yeah, yeah I think it's brilliant. wonderful. There's a large cast and ensemble field of Saving Private Ryan, but in terms of star quality, there are two standouts, and that's who we're going to go into some detail on now. Tom Hanks is our lead, Captain John Miller, and Matt Damon is a private he's trying to save, James Francis Ryan. Westy, you love Tom Hanks, surely. How is he here? Yeah. <laughs> isn't he just, isn't he great? <laughs> yeah. He's just, I think this is like his best performance, and it was a hard one, because he is such a lovable character, and very rarely do you see Tom Hanks die in a film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. very rarely do you see him you know succumb to what he has to succumb in and, and sacrifice his character for something else and it, you know i know that he was really reluctant to do this film because he was best friends with spielberg and he said if we work together this might be the end of the relationship like you know in every character that he's had before that just this real lovable guy this real everyday guy this real he's not an action star but he's always this guy you've just envisioned as like the guy next door the really lovely guy the really dedicated family man and he just plays it so well and the fear that he has in some of these sequences the fear that he he pulls across and he's just his acting prowess in this he can really do it he can do the action he can do the the regret he can do the pain he can do the emotion he can do you know the the hope and the belief and it's just so many bits where he just lets himself go and then sells the character 100 percent. and i tell you what I think this mission, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it now, I think this mission is totally flawed because Miller, for me, is far better than Ryan and any of his brothers. Like, I want that guy to live every yeah, yeah. single yeah. time. And that's the best I can say. Yeah. He is great, obviously, Tom Hanks. One of his best performances for me. I love the touch where yeah. Miller's handshake. It's not verbalised, but he's clearly suffering from yeah, PTSD. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's another really human touch. It's a very human film at its core, isn't it? One of the reasons it works so mm. well. Oh, yeah. But at the casting stage, two other big, big names were considered for the role of Captain Miller. Do you want to know who? Go on then. Yeah, no clue. Mel Gibson and Harrison Ford. Oh, of course. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. But obviously, Ford's in yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ford's, <laughs> yeah. Ford, Ford's private Ryan at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A really old private. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, Gibson. Gibson would have probably switched sides halfway through. <laughs> 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 yeah, complete agreement. I mean, and Hanks, he, 
it's a performance that goes beyond the performance. That's how important he yeah. is to this film because part of the training Spielberg put them all through a 10-day boot camp regime mm-hmm. so they would know what it's like to be part of a military unit. Well, I take them to the field. I make them eat rations. I shoot at them with blank ammunition. I beat them up. I beat on them. I make them crawl and sleep in the mud and the cold and the dirt. And Hanks had already done this because he was it. So obviously he's in Forrest Gump and there's the Vietnam section of that film, so he'd done it for that. So he kind of knew what to expect, but the rest of the cast had no idea how hard it was going to be. And after a few days, they all, like, to a man, took a vote to stop. But Hanks, the only one who, like, said no, overruled them all yeah. and said, no, it's got to be done. We've got to get through this. Yeah. And also because of that, in 2006, I think it was, he was inducted into the U.S. Army uh, Rangers Hall of Fame is an honorary member, and that's wow. mainly because of this performance in this film. Yeah, the guy that ran the training camp was called Dale Dye. He has a cameo in the film as well. Yes. Yeah. Do you know who he plays? He does. He's, he, he, we don't know where the hell he was dropped. I don't know his name, but he's in there with the with the general at the start, isn't he? Yeah, he plays one of General Marshall's yeah. aides in the scene with the Bixby letter that we talked yeah. about. Yeah. And the nice touch with the boot camp was that Spielberg made every cast member do it, except for Matt Damon. He did that because he wanted to create some resentment yes. between the others and Damon that he was being let off easy, a bit like the character in the film. Yeah. yeah. And one Matt to another Matt. Matt, what do you think of Matt Damon as Private Ryan? Matt? <laughs> lovely segue, lovely, flawless, seamless. Brilliant. <laughs> what do you think of Private Ryan, Private Barley, Matt? Matt? <laughs> Matt Damon in this. Um, it's not a bad performance. I just think they've maybe missed a trick by not casting a complete unknown in the role. I just think if they'd but cast they did someone, earlier. They did earlier. And did that's they? where you go, yeah. Oh, the name of the guy. Yeah, who you, th- yeah, who you yeah. thinks, Ryan, and then you don't really care. You just say, is this, I told oh, you he was an asshole. asshole, like nobody cares yeah, about yeah. him. Yeah, that's a good point. Because I just think if like they'd cast someone who you wouldn't look twice at in the street. Like, for example, I wouldn't take him out of the role because I think he's brilliant as up. Yeah. But imagine Jeremy Davies playing Ryan. Like, the unit go all that way and they lose two of the men and it's for this scrawny little guy. <laughs> I'll just leave him there. Not, 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 not Matt Damon who looks like the all-American college quarterback. Yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah, because of Goodwill Hunt, he's up on the poster, his name's on there now, mm. yeah. and he's already saw, so you know they're going to find him. So there's no tension over that. And I just think if they had cast an unknown, there would be this question mark over the, hill, over the whole film. Are they yeah. actually going to find him? Is, is he going to be worth it? Now, I like the fact he's a little annoying. He, he, you know, he is a bit of a brat, but when it comes down to it, I understand why he says he wants to stay because they are his only brothers eyes got left now, this yeah. unit. And, you know, that bit at the end when the bridge is being attacked and he's just howling like a baby. And that really brings home how, like, young he is, which, which I find very affecting. So definitely, definitely not a bad performance at all. I just think if they'd gone another way with the casting, it could have been a bit more interesting. Mm. Well, at the time of casting, Ethan Hawke was considered to play Ryan. So was Neil Patrick Harris. Right. Right. Uh, that would have been good. Well, Edward Norton was offered the part, but he said no because he wanted to play a Nazi, not in this film, in American History X. He did that instead. Oh, right, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Which made his career, to be fair. It did. Yeah. And Matt, you might be interested in yeah. this. Spielberg did cast Matt Damon because he wanted an unknown actor. But between being cast as Ryan and the film coming out, Damon starred in Goodwill Hunting and won an Oscar for writing the screenplay. So he wasn't famous when yeah. he was cast, intentionally. But by the time right. the film came out, he was famous. Right. And actually, wow. I think it works better that way because after looking for him for an hour, when he shows up, it's much better that it's Matt Damon than it's somebody that we don't know, I think. Right. Okay, fair enough. With a bazooka yeah, as it's, well. Yeah, brilliant. it's great. It's, it's <laughs> the best kind of Matt Damon. Sick Rambo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bazooka Damon, me favourite. How would you like them apples? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Damon gets a monologue before the Battle at Ramel sequence where Ryan tells Miller about his brothers and tells a story about his brother getting with Alice, a girl who hit every branch on the ugly tree <laughs> and hit everyone on the way down brilliant. Yeah. And Damon ad-libbed the whole story and Spielberg was like, he, he was just enamoured by it and kept it in. But you can see Hanks' yeah. reaction to this is so yeah. good because yeah. he doesn't know where it's coming. But I love it when it's just that that real laugh from Damon and yeah, he's trying great. to deliver the story through the laugh. Oh, it's so, it's fantastic. Also, on the back of that, you know the very first scene in the cemetery we see an older Ryan played by Harrison Young with his family. In the novelization of the film by yes. Max Allen Collins, there's more dialogue in that scene, and Ryan calls his wife Alice. 
suggesting that he married the girl from his story, which is a nice touch. Wow, Not really? Right. <laughs> wow. If he didn't earn it then, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Swapping seconds after his brother. Oh. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. This <laughs> <laughs> goes all like that, Adam. <laughs> As we mentioned at the start of this section, there is an ensemble feel to the film and the rest of the company. Tom Sizemore's Horvath, Edward Burns' as Reben, Jeremy Davies as Upham, Vin Diesel as Capazzo, Adam Goldberg as Mellish, Barry Pepper as Jackson and Giovanni Rabisi as Wade all get their moments. And in the two big names, oh, yeah. Tom Hanks and Matt Damon, they lead the film very well. They do, yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. An epic war film, so we had a lot of epic moments to pick from when choosing our highlights from Saving Private Ryan. Matt, what are you going for as your highlight? Mm. Well, where are you going to start first? But Omaha, um, of because course. there have been many, many films where I've cried at the end because of what's happened to a character. This is the first yeah. and probably only film where I'm, I'm crying after 20 minutes. <laughs> There's so many stories, isn't there, of this film being screened for the veterans and it would get to this part yeah. and they would be putting their hands up saying, yeah. Look, y- you need to stop it, or they would have to walk out because it's that realistic. And the sheer craft that Spielberg brings here is incredible, mm. mm-hmm. but it never feels like he's showing off. None of this is cool. Everything there is designed to, and Wesley's going to like this word, everything's designed to horrify, <laughs> and it's packed full of little touches that I'd never seen before. The audio could not when they dive over the sides into the water. The fact that some of the soldiers don't even make it to the beach and they drown because the equipment is too heavy and that beach just swimming in blood by the end and that shot you get when Miller picks the helmet up and it's full of other people's blood but he just rams it on his head yeah. and the blood is pouring down his face. For me, that's the most indelible image of the film. That that sums it up to me. With that shaking and, and, hand as well, isn't and it? And the shaking hand and the sound that those... Brief glimpses you get of men with limbs being blown off, the blood spin on the camera. It, it's as we've said, it's hell on earth. Mm. But even when the Americans get to the top and they overrun the German positions, what's really clever, Spielberg doesn't give you a sense of victory. There's a really telling reaction for Miller when he sees the Americans laughing about shooting the surrendered Germans, or when mm. they yell and don't no, shoot, shoot, let them burn. Let them burn! And I totally get their reaction after what they've been through, but the way Miller looks at them tells you all you need to know about the true horror and cost of war. And the sequence for me, it's not lost one bit of its power. I mean, the location's excellent. I mean, famously shot in the South Island, a place called Curraclaw, really, really well placed that. Cool. It was originally it was supposed to be Horden Beach in County Durham, just up the road. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which about I, I would have been there. From us. Just yeah. be like, I'll be the guy who looks for his arm. Because <laughs> that would have been me. <laughs> it's running about, oh, for fuck's sake. Been here two minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive sequence. Spielberg didn't storyboard any of it to create the urgency and intensity that he wanted. And I like how he shoots the whole thing from three points of view. We get Captain Miller's point of view, the German machine mm-hmm. gunner's point of view, where they're just like shooting fish in a barrel. Mm-hmm. Incredible POV, that. Yeah. And like a characterless yeah. camera that seems to move freely throughout the beach. And on top of that, we get underwater shots, slow motion, time lapse shots. It's all just incredible filmmaking, I think. Yeah, I mean, this. I think the sequence alone would put this film in Hollywood history, but it was a huge production. I think the budget was $70 million, and the sequence alone cost $12 million of that, oh. and it took 61 days to shoot. And 25 of those were just on the opening sequence alone, and there were 1,000 extras in total for the film. Mm. Massive. Worth it, though, surely. Oh yeah. Do you think absolutely. that was down to it not being to, to it not being storyboarded and to it yeah, kind possibly, of how yeah. that feel? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about how realistic the film feels to watch, and they went to some lengths in the production to achieve that. Like real amputees were used mm-hmm. when they see that guy get blown and his leg comes mm-hmm. off, yeah. and then it still goes to Miller. Like it, yeah. it's an explosion, and then we're just going to use the same shot. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. Like local reenactment groups who specialised in World War Two were cast as extras in the battle scenes. Yeah, gunfire sound effects were recorded from live gunfire from World War Two weapons, which you can so mm. tell when it cuts into that German bunker. And oh, it's just, yeah. it's just yeah. oh, it's horrible. It's a horrible yeah. sound. 
You know, and two of the landing craft used in Omaha Beach scenes were actually used in World War Two. There was 40 barrels of fake blood, which is wow. what lines the whole sea. And 17,000 bullet squibs were used. 17,000 squibs. Mm. And you know, one of the best ones is that people don't normally realise is when his battalion sergeant's on the ground and Wade's there yeah. and the guy on the left-hand side gets hit in the canteen. Yeah. It starts as water and then comes out as pure yeah. blood. It's a tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny thing. But for me, it just totally adds to it because he's just like, oh, God. You know, and he's give us a chance, give us a chance. Yeah. It's just so, so well yeah, done. Yeah, it's a great detail. I think maybe the most impressive thing about the realism is how it was perceived by actual veterans. After the film came out, the Department of Veterans Affairs in America set up a special number that former soldiers could call who were traumatised after seeing the film. Mm. And there's a renowned military historian called Stephen Ambrose who appeared in World at War, yes. the acclaimed World War II documentary. A special screening was arranged just for him, and 20 minutes in, he had to ask for it to be stopped because he couldn't handle it, like you, Matt. Yeah. He said he was watching, he said <laughs> watching all the things interviewees had been describing to him for 30 years, and he just couldn't take it. Mm. And yeah. last but not least, James Dewan. You know who James Dewan is, right? Scotty from Star Trek. Scotty from Star Trek. Yeah. He was there yeah. in Normandy, yeah. and he was shot six times oh. and lost his middle finger, and he praised Spielberg for how realistic it was. Wow. So, I mean, if it's wow. good enough for Scotty, good enough for me. What is it? Well, it's... Um... It's green. The chances of getting a Star Trek reference in a save from Pirate Ryan absolutely nil. For a video drum. Slow hand clap. Slow clap. I'm more impressed than I seem. <laughs> and we'll see what's your highlight in the film. My highlight is what people kind of don't really think about. I mean, we've got... There's, there's, there was a couple I could have touched on because you guys kind of bagged the start and the end, which is fair enough, because they're two massive, massive sequences, huge. But for me, there's the, the radar tower that kind of, it, it happens in the middle of their trip oh, yeah. to Ramel, and they're almost there, and it's Miller talking to the rest of the group, and none of the other group, or none of the squad agree with it, and he plays the father figure. And when he tells Hovath to shut up... Maybe you should shut up. Oh, yeah. That really, like, it breaks my yeah, heart. Maybe you should shut yeah. up, and it just yeah. breaks my heart. And then he says, there's a line in there, you know, when is the last time you felt good about anything? Yeah. And to me, I was like, wow, yeah, we've all been through that in COVID. Like, you can turn around now and just be like, you can tell the hopelessness of this. It's just, when's the last time you actually, you know, celebrated anything? You can imagine the hell that they've been through for the amount of time that they've been through it. And the great thing about this sequence is that it was done completely on the fly. They were meant to attack the radar station and Spielberg had the camera going up behind each one on the steady cams and then going up behind each one in like a really erratic camera and was going to cut that together. But the the light wasn't right. It was completely overcast. It looked rubbish. And Spielberg's like, right, we're going to say this from up and point of view. Then we're just going to give him like right. a look because that comes from nowhere, that little telescope. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, well, just give him that. He's bound to have it. He's a nerd. So he's got it and he's watching it. So just put loads of haze, loads of smoke machines in there. And they just shot it from his point of view, which is absolute genius. Because then it puts you in his point yeah. of view, which sets up the ending even harder. Because you're like, do you want to go anywhere near that? No. And then you see the death of innocence. You see the only person who is actually there with any empathy and any thought for anyone else and he's there just to help other people and he's the only person being taken out by it. Mm. And they don't know what they're doing and you kind of just lose all faith and all hope and you have one of the best moments from Hanks for me when he just finds his own space and he just walks into the radar tower and just breaks down, yeah. thinks he's looking at the map and he loses it completely and yeah. he's just he's just so done with everything but he has to hold it together yeah. as a father figure and I think, again, Spielberg really, really related to that and I think this whole sequence is just about him coming out and saying that and then realising he's got to tell the truth about himself. I'm a school teacher. I mean even just this bit in the end as a film is incredible just the whole yeah. twist of this guy he lets go comes back and shoots him at the end it's just it kicks you right in the gut it's fantastic. Yeah where Wade dies is one of those moments of humanity that I talked about Wade's already told us about his mother yeah. earlier and then when his final word before he dies is mama Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then Miller's speech about wanting to go home is fantastic. Again, very human. I know that in the original script, the speech was a lot longer, but Hanks felt that his character wouldn't like talking about himself. So he said to Spielberg they should shorten it. Mm. Spielberg agreed, and they cut it right down by more than half. And it's oh, just wow. enough yeah, as well, isn't it? It's, it's just perfect. enough. Because yeah. it keeps you wanting more, but you're like, yeah. okay, yeah, that was hard enough for you to do. Yeah. yeah. The Omaha beach landing is the action sequence in Saving Private Ryan that always gets talked about. But for my highlight, I'm going for the final battle. The Battle at Rommel. Oof. <laughs> Again, the level of action movie making is just off the charts. The shaky handheld shots are here. Spielberg moves us around this ruined town. It's always crystal clear what's going on. But I mentioned earlier how the battle scenes in Saving Private Ryan are tough to watch. And it's this sequence that I was mostly talking about. The scenes yeah, where the company are waiting for the Germans to arrive, they're just sitting around talking, telling each other stories and listening to Edith Piaf. Mm. The tension, knowing what's coming, yeah. I just find it unbearable. And then when the action yeah, starts, horrible. the team start getting killed one by one, and each death's really memorable. Jackson dies when a tank blows up the bell tower. Horvath dies a slow death after being shot by a German soldier. And the most memorable... And worst kill has to be the fight to the yeah. death between Mellish and the German soldier. Oh. Ah! Ah! Honestly, this might be the hardest scene I've ever watched. First time I saw it, it was yeah, in my head for about a week afterwards. I mean, Adam Goldberg played Eddie in Friends. Now, I want to hear you say you want me out. I want you out. No, no, no. I want to hear it from your lips. But even that can't lighten the mood here. It's <laughs> tough, tough stuff to watch that. <laughs> I mean, there's thousands of war movies, just World War II movies even, and I've never seen any battle scenes anywhere that I find as unsettling as the ones in Saving Private Ryan, and especially in Rommel. Mm. And that, I think, is one of the main things that makes Saving Private Ryan so great. Yeah, yeah. it's brilliant from Spielberg to put that visually and emotionally in there, that the slowest death in the film is a Jew killed by yeah. a Nazi. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is tortured mm. basically. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah. Don't tell anyone about oh. this. We're killing you, and we don't want yeah. anyone to know. Yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. just the, it's the Holocaust mm. in one I scene. That, yeah. Basically, mm. yeah. yeah. And it's the Hitler Youth knife that mm. kills him that he got in the trench. Oh, awful. So yeah. there's this whole, yeah, this whole thing that comes round, and he's like, well, the person who needs to suffer the most by this hand is the Jewish character. Absolutely, mm. Spielberg's genius in doing yeah. that and pulls you through it. Yeah. Then, yeah, when they're waiting and them tanks are coming and it's just rattling. Horrible. Oh, the tension really is insane. That. And then Ryben comes round on that little bike yeah. and he's like, oh, there's yeah. loads of them in the flank. Yeah. And I was like, well, they're going to yeah. take my flank. I'll be like, right, see you later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, yeah. I just felt like yeah. running. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking out of there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the sequence as well. I, I can barely watch the Mellish death anymore. Yeah. You know, I yeah. did feel like just skipping it, leaving the room. It's just beyond horrible. Mm-hmm. But the big difference between this and Omar sequence is that this wasn't based on a real event. The battle in the town are both made up for the film. Although there is a real battle that it took some inspiration from, and that took place in a town called uh, La Fier, which was three days after Normandy. And mm-hmm. the Rommel set was built in an abandoned airfield in Hatfield, England, actually. And oh, did yeah. you know it's also the village we see earlier in the film? In you know, the rear. Ah. gets killed in the rear. Yeah. It's the same set to three dress called uh, Nerville or Plain. Yeah. 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 Just shot from different angles, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I think the bell tower's the same one that Jackson's in when he kills the sniper. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Truly would be, yeah. Didn't they just, they built it real and then actually bombed it? Yeah. That's right, yeah. It was yeah. like World War Two bombs actually put in place and then just blown it. Oh, Jesus Christ. Brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. If you had the chance to do it, you definitely would, wouldn't oh, you, as yeah. a filmmaker? Like to, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, World War Two bombs. <laughs> like, yeah, of course you can't steal them. Fucking great. <laughs> Huge moments from the first to the last second of Saving Private Ryan. Those three, all brilliant. And the Omaha Beach landing, part of movie history? Easily. Without question. Easily one of the best openings to any film ever made, ever by anyone. <laughs> Westy, you're up first, please. Your summary and score okay. for Saving Private Ryan. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get a bad rep for this because I'm just getting everything top marks <laughs> over the last... What, what's it? Well, how many have we done? Nine? Eight or nine? Like the last eight or nine videos? I'm like, uh, I mean, I cannot wait for something coming. I mean, something's coming up in the future that I'm not going to give anything past a three, I think. Maybe. No spoilers. What? But um, 
it's just yeah it had such an impact on me and this is when cinema turned into something a lot more visceral and a lot more real and a lot more emotional and a lot more powerful and a lot more personal i really really thought that this was just talking to me when i saw it yeah. and it was something that it was personal and it was my emotions and my feelings and it was pulling us through something it didn't feel like it was a huge film for a massive audience it felt like it was made just for me to experience the way I'd experienced it. And I didn't think anyone else... And, and I'd actually, I didn't believe anyone else would have experienced it the same way as I did, even if I spoke to them. Like, I spoke to my brother, I spoke to my dad after it, and they were like, that was fantastic. I was like, oh, but you didn't think it was as fantastic as I thought it was fantastic. Mm. Like, you didn't get it on the level yeah. I got it. And I, I'm still the same now. I'm still really protective of this film. Yeah. It's the first. It's, it's when I completely abandoned the Oscars and just said they're not worth fucking shit. <laughs> the other guy that we really need to thank, though, is Harvey Weinstein. Here he is. Abandoned but I can't tell you what won anything after '98. <laughs> I didn't care anymore. I just did not care. It just wiped that out, and it put, like I said, it put Spielberg up there as one of the greatest filmmakers of all. The best of the best. There wasn't anything better than this. It's just the craft of filmmaking, and it's going to live up there with anything else that I've seen, that anything else with that kind of impact. It's just an incredible film made by an incredible filmmaker and an incredible time with an incredible cast. So, 10 out of 10, obviously. Yeah, to the surprise of nobody, <laughs> I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, classic. as we've talked about, the level of filmmaking here is incredible. The battle scenes are sensational. Some of the best ever put on film for me. That alone makes it a great war movie. But also, the writing isn't found wanting either. There's a really unique narrative which runs through everything, which works really well. The cast are all at their best too. One of the best collaborations between Spielberg and Janusz Kaminski. If anybody said to me this was their favourite Spielberg film, I'd be fine with it. That's how great I think it is. The greatest yeah. World War II movie, in my opinion. For me personally, though, I'm not a huge war movie fan generally, and this isn't one of my favourite yeah. films. It is a great film, and for me, it's a 9 out of 10. Okay. okay. West is furious. <laughs> that's fine. No, that's fine. <laughs> I just don't. I just don't understand what, what, you, what you mean. <laughs> that's not that. Yeah. It's one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> and Matt, your summary and score, please, for SPR. Mm. Oh. Come on, Matt. <laughs> Imagine no thinking pressure. Shakespeare and Love is a better film than this. Imagine. <laughs> imagine imagine being, trying to make that argument. Being that stupid. Mm. <laughs> no. Um, very similar to West City, because I do genuinely remember coming out of this and just feeling so shook by it. And it was a film. I was literally thinking about it for weeks afterwards. Moments, mm. images just lodged in my head. And I found it, as Wesley says, a very humbling experience, actually, to watch this. The craft that Spielberg displays, second to none. And yes, he's a sentimental filmmaker, but here that sentimentality is completely justified. Mm -hmm. And hand in hand with the craft, the emotion behind it, he's created something that no war film since has come close to equalising. Performances are brilliant. This is easily in my top five Spielberg, and therefore it's a, just an easy 10. Lovely. So overall, that leaves Saving Private Ryan with 29 out of 30. A whopper. Could it's he... not a whopper enough, though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were furious, I could tell. <laughs> oh, I'm in. fine, I'm fine. No, I totally respect your opinion. You... <laughs> so Shakespeare and Love all over again. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's it for this episode. If you like what we do here on The Cutting Room, you can access bonus episodes of the show by supporting us on Patreon. You can also get access to over 200 hours worth of all the right movies, podcasts, and lots more. And you can also get those podcasts on our website. 79 pence per episode, which is a steal. Oof, they're like two and a half hours long, aren't oh, they, for massively. 79 pence? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's so many on there, all the classics. They're all massively researched and, yeah, at least two hours in length, so very in-depth. So go and take a look. But for now, we're going to say goodbye and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yeah. Yes, thanks, thanks guys. guys. Thank you. Oh, you know what, though? You know what would have been really good if we could have done it? What's that? If we'd done this on location, actually went to Normandy, got like some you know, oh, authenticity yeah. to it. That would have been Proper respectful. That would have been class. Yeah. Like on the beach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would have been brilliant, but I have all my notes in front of me here. Can I take my laptop? <laughs>